Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Andrew Missick, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the St. Jude Thaddeus story. I am making this recording in the lower Rio Grande Valley in Texas. Now, where's that at? Well, that's from between Brownsville to uh, McAllen, that area there along the border. And in this area, it doesn't take long before you see that St. Jude Thaddeus is a very popular saint among Catholics and you see pictures of St. Jude Thaddeus all over the place. And how do you know it's a picture? Well, it's a man that looks similar to Jesus Christ, except he's holding the image of the holy face of Jesus. And the reason why St. Jude Thaddeus is so popular is because he's considered the patron saint of lost and desperate causes. And over the years, he's uh, gathered quite a following as the patron saint of the last chance or lost causes, the, the time of desperation turned to St. Jude. In the Catholic Church, you have the idea of the intercession of the saints, where you have one of the saints intercede with you to bring your prayers before God Almighty, and it's considered uh, effectacious in getting answers to prayers among Catholics. And of course, Protestants are like, no, we just pray uh, to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, only to God. But uh, the Bible does mention how the saints uh, do intercede for us. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about a great cloud of witnesses. Uh, it mentions in the Old New Testament, Rachel weeping for her children. So the idea is that the saints are in heaven uh, interceding for us. So that's where the Catholic Church builds this doctrine on. But um, Protestants look at it and say, hey, wait, you know, we only uh, pray to God. So... There's a dispute, but in the Catholic tradition, the idea of uh, the intercession of saints is, is embraced. So you look around and you see these images of St. Jude Thaddeus all over the place. And among Protestants, I think that uh, we should pay attention to the lives of the Twelve Apostles, right? Uh, the role they played in the Bible and their further adventures, which are recorded in the writings of the early church fathers. So this is something, when you look at the saints, I think their lives serves serve as an inspiration to all Christians regardless of what denomination they belong to. And I think that the 12 apostles especially can bring us all together in Christian unity because these were people that were chosen by Jesus Christ himself and sent out to share his message and uh, on the essential message of the good news of the kingdom of God. Uh, despite denominations, we agree on the message as delivered by the apostles and as recorded in the Holy Bible. So Jude is Jude Thaddeus, one of the 12 apostles of Jesus, who's mentioned in the Gospels. Among Protestants, this, there seems to be the idea that there's different apostles named Jude, where you have Jude Thaddeus, and then you have Jude, the brother of our Lord. And the Catholic Church sees Jude Thaddeus and Jude, the brother of our Lord, as the same person. But we have an epistle in the Bible called the Epistle of Jude, and the Catholic Church identifies this epistle as being written by Jude Thaddeus himself. And Protestants see this as a different Jude, Jude the brother of our Lord. But we don't really know for certain. It could be Jude Thaddeus who wrote that epistle. But what we do know is that Jude wrote an epistle, one of these apostles of Jesus Christ, and it's included in the New Testament. So here in the valley, you see these images of St. Jude Thaddeus all over the place. And you see him holding the holy face of Jesus. And what this picture of St. Jude Thaddeus does is it tells an important part of his story. And a lot of people don't know what's going on in the picture and exactly who St. Jude is. Down here, the idea is that he's uh, the patron saint of lost and desperate causes, and that's why he's popular. Uh, the idea among some Catholics is that since his name, Jude, is the same as Judas, there are two Judases. There's Jude Thaddeus or Judas Thaddeus, and there's Judas Iscariot. One was a holy disciple and one was a traitor. And since they have the same name, the idea is that uh, St. Jude Thaddeus fell into obscurity. So uh, the idea is that if you devote yourself to St. Jude, since he's been forgotten and left out, you'll, your prayers will have more success if you focus on him in his life. But transdenominationally, we need to see that Jude was chosen by Jesus Christ and sent to the peoples of the East. And we have uh, documents about St. Jude 
and attributed to St. Jude that have survived from the early church period that I think speak to all Christians or whatever denomination. So let's get to the picture of St. Jude. Why does he have a picture of the face of Jesus? Well, uh, I was reading an article about the popularity of St. Jude in, uh, in Mexico, and they're, and they're trying to explain this and say, well, the picture of the face of Jesus represents evangelism, right? Which means sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And what is that? The message that God loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, in the world that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So the idea is that Jesus was sent by God the Father, and he died on the cross for our sins. And if we repent of our sins and believe in him, accept him to our hearts and are born again, then we have salvation through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and we have salvation, the cleansing of sins through the blood of Jesus. And that's what evangelism is all about. And like I said, these essentials of the gospel, even though Protestants and Catholics and Orthodox argue about different things, we agree on that, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of the world. He's God in the flesh, and he is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way for forgiveness of sins and salvation. So Thaddeus was sent by Jesus to evangelize. We know this because in the Bible it talks about Jesus sending his disciples out two by two to evangelize. They came back to him and told him the great things they did in his name. And after Jesus died and rose again, he gave the great commission. Jesus says to his apostles, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach this gospel to all creatures. Whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. Whoever believes not shall be condemned. And you shall do great works and miracles in my name. We see these stories at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, the end of the Gospel of Luke, and the beginning of Acts, and in the beginning of the end, the end, I mean, of the Gospel of Mark. So that's true, that Thaddeus represents a missionary, an evangelist, someone goes out and shares the good news of Jesus Christ. But there is a story about St. Jude Thaddeus that's recorded in the early church fathers. And what happened is in the city of Edessa, they had an image that was associated with St. Jude, because according to Eusebius, the father of church history, St. Jude went to take the gospel to the Assyrians in Edessa, and he converted their king, King Abgar. This is a famous story that's mentioned a lot in the early sources. But in some of these traditions, there is an image of the face of Jesus Christ, which is associated with St. Jude Thaddeus. And it's described in, in various ways in the earliest sources. Some sources say that it was a painting, but other sources describe it as a miraculous image that was not made by human hands, that somehow God created this miraculous image. And in some accounts, Jesus formed this image himself by placing his face on a cloth. So in the city of Edessa, for centuries, they kept this image of the face of Jesus Christ and it was called the Holy Image of Edessa. Finally, the Eastern Roman Empire, the, what we call the Byzantines, came, and Edessa had been taken by the Muslims, and uh, the emperor of Byzantium, he wanted the, uh, the Holy Image of Edessa to take to Constantinople, and uh, he negotiated with the Muslims, and he took it. So, really, we don't know what happened to the Holy Image of Edessa. However, among the Eastern Christians, the memory of this this miraculous portrait of Jesus has survived to this day. And you see icons showing the, man, they call it the Mandalayan, this whole image of the face of Jesus that was associated with St. Jude Thaddeus. So St. Jude went to the city of Edessa and he preached before King Abgar. And part of that story is that Abgar was given an image of the face of Jesus, a miraculous image. And like I said, there's different accounts and different traditions. Uh, I think in the doctrine of Adai and other ancient sources, it was described as a painting made by one of the servants of the king. But other works like the, uh, uh, the Acts of the Apostle Mari, who was the disciple of St. Jude Thaddeus, described this as an image not made by human hands. He placed his face on the cloth and the image was formed. So this was kept, like I said, in Edessa uh, in the east for centuries until it was taken to Constantinople and we don't know exactly what happened to it. Now, there is in Turin, Italy, a, uh, it's about three and a half feet by 14 feet uh, shroud called the Shroud of Turin. And it has the bloodstained image of, of a, a man that fits the description of uh, what Jesus endured on the cross. Uh, this person 
had a crown of thorns. You can see the, the, the blood drops from the crown of thorns. He was flogged the way the Bible describes Jesus as being flogged. He was crucified. You can see the blood coming from the nail prints in his hands and on his feet. And uh, his side was pierced the way it describes Jesus side being pierced. We see the blood flowed out the way it described, is described in the Gospel of John. Now there's a lot of controversy surrounding the Shroud of Turin. And in the Protestant Church we have this hymn, My faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So I look at the Shroud of Turin and the official position of the Catholic Church is not to have a position at all. They see it as um, an image to reflect on the sufferings of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, one of the ways Protestants in the past have criticized Catholics, it's like you see, you see crosses and they have the crucified Jesus on it, and Protestants say, well, Jesus isn't on the cross anymore, he rose again. But the idea, of course, the Catholic Church isn't denying that Jesus rose again from the dead, they affirm that, of course, as do all Christians, right? Protestant, Catholic, and Eastern Orthodox, and the Assyrian Church of the East, Ethiopian Church, we all agree that Jesus died on the cross and he rose again victorious over death, hell, and the grave on the third day. Uh, so what they're doing is this is a devotional exercise to reflect on the price that Jesus paid out of love, uh, how he was tormented and suffered so that our sins would be forgiven. And that's probably a good practice to reflect on how Jesus Christ suffered and died for our sins. And that was what Mel Gibson was trying to get across in the Passion of Christ movie, right? Where he does it in, in Aramaic and Latin, so you, you can see the story transcends language, and uh, we see a reflection on the suffering of Jesus Christ and the burden he carried to die for the sins of all mankind. So, but let's look at the shroud. Many people have different uh, theories. It's very controversial. I recommend the works by Ian Wilson. He wrote uh, uh, several books on the shroud, a book called The Shroud of Turin, The Blood in the Shroud, and others, The Shroud, the illustrated book. Um, and uh, there are some people that think that the shroud was uh, just a painting somebody did. But I think there's a lot of good reason to believe the shroud is authentic. But like I said, if the shroud was proven to be a work of art, uh, that wouldn't disappoint me. It's still a wonderful, amazing work of art, nonetheless. But I think there's reasons to believe it's authentic. Uh, and part of it is uh, they did a tar carbon 14 dating uh, back in the late 80s, and they dated it. They, they said that it dated to the mid-1200s, right? But the problem is these people who did the uh, carbon-14 dating, they weren't experts in the shroud, uh, and there's a lot of uh, people disagreeing with their discoveries, or their, their findings anyway. Uh, it's disputed. Uh, was the test taken properly? Was it a good sample? The problem is to do carbon-14 dating, you have to incinerate a part of the shroud. And uh, they're thinking that the, 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 the sample they used to destroy to date it uh, was not a good sample. So there's a lot of controversy and people who believe in the authenticity of the shroud take issue with a lot of aspects of that testing that was done. But in, in, uh, when I got my degree in, in college, I studied art history. And my personal opinion is that somebody who studied art history is I don't think that uh, there was an artist capable of creating that image in the 1200s because uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire, a lot of knowledge of perspective and anatomy and things, physiology and things like that had been lost. And later on in the Italian Renaissance, these things were discovered again. So I just don't see how an artist could have created that in the time period which they contend that it was created. Uh, and no one has been able to explain how an artist in the Middle Ages could have created that image. Another interesting thing is when artists tried to duplicate uh, artists of the period tried to duplicate the shroud, they couldn't achieve, uh, they couldn't recreate the image. And no scientist or somebody trying to debunk it has been able to do that to this day. So I think there's a good case that the shroud is authentic. I think, I don't know if I was going to put a percentage on it, I would say it's like 80% chance the shroud of Turin is the actual shroud of Jesus Christ. That's my opinion. Uh, you can read about it and come up with your own opinion. Uh, one of these people is trying to argue the shroud isn't authentic was saying, well, it's actually a painting that was created for a passion play back in the Middle Ages, and it just became uh, well-known and beloved, and people thought it was authentic. So there is a lot of interest in the Shroud of Turin. Every year it's displayed, uh, and it's not displayed very often, probably once every three to five years. Millions of people come and see it, 
And like I said, uh, the jury's out. And people like Ian Wilson, who argue for uh, authenticity, make a very good argument. So in a video about uh, St. Jude Thaddeus, why am I talking about uh, the Shroud of Turin? Because let's just say for sake of argument that the Shroud uh, is indeed authentic, that this is the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. So then where did it come from? Well, we do have a story of one of the apostles who, who carried an image of Jesus that was made by uh, him pressing his face on the cloth that was taken to Edessa. So the idea that Ian Wilson has come up with is that the shroud was folded up and put in a frame and displayed as a portrait and that actually is the full body image front and back of Jesus but when the Christians of the East, when the Assyrians displayed it, they displayed only the face. So I think that's probable and I think that if the shroud is authentic, and I lead, lean towards it being authentic, that it must have come from Thaddeus and the interpretation of the story by Ian Wilson must be true. However, we have to look at the ancient sources. Of course, the story of King Abgar and Jude Thaddeus is found in the writings of uh, Eusebius, who wrote around the year 20, 325. In the year 325, he wrote this account uh, about Thaddeus, Jude Thaddeus going and preaching before King Abgar. Then we have this account also uh, told about the message between King Abgar and Jesus and Thaddeus' mission over there to Edessa. That's also found in uh, the writing of a Christian pilgrim woman named Jeria. She also mentions the story. Now the official accounts by the Assyrian Christians is called the Doctrine of Adai. In Aramaic, Thaddeus is called Mar Adai. And uh, in that account, it mentions Hanan, the steward of King Abgar, and it mentions this holy image of the face of Jesus Christ. Then, uh, some Bible scholars believe, or, or you know, early church historians believe that there's a trilogy, an apostolic trilogy, among the Assyrian Christians, where you have the doctrine of Adai, which is the story of St. Jude Thaddeus taking the gospel to King Abgar and teaching the gospel. And it's, it's a really good book. I like uh, how Thaddeus explains the essentials of Christian theology. And it's a good, the doctrine of the teaching of Adai. And I think that it's, especially that section of the doctrinal teachings, the theological teachings of, of, King, uh, of, of Thaddeus, of Jude Thaddeus, are uh, accessible to all Christians, and these are our teachings that Christians of whatever denomination would agree on. It's a pretty good story. So you have the Doctrine of Adai, and then you have the Acts of St. Uh, Thomas, and it's the story of Thomas going to India. And then you have the Acts of the Apostle Marmari, who was probably one of the 70 disciples of Jesus and the personal assistant disciple of St. Jude Thaddeus. And in the... Uh, the Acts of the Apostle Mari, it says that this image that was kept in Edessa was an image, a miraculous image, not made by the hands of men. And in Ar the Armenian traditions and other traditions, you have the idea that Jesus placed his faith, uh, that Jesus placed his face on a cloth, and that's how the image was created. Have faith in God. I tell you the truth. If someone says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you will be able to move mountains. So there's different traditions, but probably what happened is perhaps this image made its way to the east and, and uh, Thaddeus brought it over, but the story wasn't written down until decades or perhaps centuries later. And so, so different versions of the story developed with the passing of time until, until the stories were written down. So in some accounts, the holy image of Edessa was a portrait made by Hanan.
and other accounts is a miraculous image not made by human hand and in fact made by Jesus pressing his face on a cloth. Now if that's the Shroud of Turin, Jesus did press his, had his face placed on the cloth, but actually his entire body. So Ian Wilson says what happened is that the Shroud was folded up and displayed as a portrait and that is the holy image of Edessa. But other Eastern Christians say no, the holy image of Edessa was a, a different image and I think there's the San Silvestro image, another one that people believe uh, is more reflective of what the holy image of Edessa was. But this image, which was lost, uh, is even though it's lost hundreds of years ago, uh, the idea of this holy image of Edessa is still remembered in the Russian Orthodox Church and other Orthodox churches. The idea of the Mandalaya or the holy image of Edessa is still very pronounced. And it's very interesting, right? that when you see pictures of St. Jude Thaddeus, you see him holding in his hands the holy image of Edessa. Here in the valley, in the Rio Grande Valley, if you go around, and we have a shrine of St. Jude down here, and St. Jude's always holding the mandolin, the sacred image of the face of Jesus Christ. So, uh, my opinion is that, like I said, I place my faith on the revelation uh, of Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament and the message delivered to us by his apostles. So I place my faith on the scripture and upon Jesus Christ, the eternal word of God. But, you know, I've done archeological work and uh, relics have been discovered. And during the Protestant Reformation, you know, uh, Luther and others would criticize the, what they called the cult of relics. And uh, some of these relics were considered to be forgeries. But just because some relics are forgeries, that doesn't mean they all were. And I was reading this, I think CNN did a, uh, a mini-series on the life of Jesus, several, or just a couple of years ago. And they carbon tested one of these bones, which was supposed to be of one of the apostles. And uh, they, they tested that, that skeleton. And it was, a, based on their research, is the bones of a Middle Eastern man from the time of Jesus. So, like I was saying, it's true that, you know, Luther mocked, like they had these, this is the true nail that pierced the, the, the hand of Jesus. And Luther said, well, if uh, people collected all the, the true nails that Jesus did around the world, you'd have enough nails to shoe every horse in Saxony. He's ridiculing it. But the fact of the matter is, even today, uh, relics or artifacts are important. And even in Protestantism, uh, where you know people go on archaeological, I've done archaeological uh, work, uh, but the idea that you could find an artifact that verifies the truth of scripture is something that people are very interested in. And uh, like the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Bible manuscripts so old that, that Jesus and his apostles may have looked upon those scrolls themselves. So there is value in, uh, in relics. And another thing about relics, it's in the New Testament, is it mentions that Peter's shadow would fall on people who were ill and they would be healed. That's what it says in the Bible. And Paul would take his garments and, and tear them and give, you know, this is a garment that's worn by Paul, and he'd take a little piece of it off and give it to someone who was sick, and they would be healed. So this is something that happened in the, the New Testament, where these relics were used uh, with miraculous uh, effect. But also, like I said, even among Protestants, like we have the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C., and people will go there and, and see, or to recreate things. So there's, there's like the Ark Encounter in, in Kentucky, where... Someone built the Ark, uh, Noah's Ark, a full-scale mock model. So I think there is a benefit in artifacts or, or things that people can touch and feel to understand the Bible story better. And uh, my father, he's convinced that the shroud is authentic. And uh, he thinks it's alluded to in the Bible where it says that there were many indisputable proofs of the resurrection. And he thinks that the shroud itself uh, was one of those proofs. And there is some indication here and there among the writings of the Church Fathers that could be alluding to uh, the Shroud, especially the story of, of St. Jude Thaddeus and this holy image, uh, which is this, this story, even though a lot of people, a lot of Catholics venerate, they venerate St. Jude Thaddeus. Uh, they're not aware of what's going on in the painting where he's holding the sacred image. So the image of the face of Jesus Christ that he's holding is an image uh, that was related to the story of King Abgar, where Abgar was given this image. My Lord, King Abgar, I bring to you a gift from James the Just, the Bishop of Jerusalem, 
and brother of our Lord, and from all of the holy apostles. This is the image of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. So like I said, in some accounts it's a painting, uh, in other accounts it was uh, an image face, uh, placed by Jesus placing his face on a cloth. Uh, but regardless, in the ancient stories, uh, Thaddeus is associated with preaching before King Abgar and an image of the face of Jesus Christ. <laughs> being given to King Abgar uh, through the work of Thaddeus. And the, the theory is that if the Shroud of Turin is authentic, that perhaps the image that St. Jude uh, gave to King Abgar was the actual Shroud of Jesus Christ himself, and it was folded and displayed as a portrait, and it has retained in the memory of the Eastern Christians to this day as the holy image of, of Edessa, also called the Mandalion. So it's very interesting, uh, and uh, like I said, I think that St. Jude is speaking to this generation of the Lord. Jesus Christ is speaking to this generation through the apostles and through St. Jude. And perhaps uh, the story of the Shroud is a way to get people uh, to learn the story of, of St. Jude. And like I said, I've got many friends in the Assyrian Church of the East. And uh, you know, some people embrace the idea that the image that was carried by Jude Thaddeus is actually the Shroud. Other people say, no, the holy image of Odessa was a different image. But be that as it may, like I said, we're, we're dealing with the Articles of Faith, and we're also dealing with history, but also legend. And I think that people need to read the stories, become familiar with it, and make up your own mind. So, we do have our film. I got my docudrama series, which we do in this webisode uh, series. But we have our movie, our feature film. We have our feature film called St. Jude Thaddeus, The Legend of the Shroud, where we kind of use the Shroud story to to bring people into the story of St. Jude Thaddeus and the Assyrian Christian community that he founded. Uh, so, remember, we have our products, my storybook, the St. Jude Thaddeus storybook, based on, uh, which uses photographs uh, from the docudrama series, from these webisodes, and we also have our feature film, St. Jude Thaddeus, The Legend of the Shroud, and I'm working on a storybook on that right now, and it will be available very soon. And we also have products available uh, to promote our production company because we're looking towards doing uh, more films and uh, in the future. Uh, so, like I said before, the message of St. Jude Thaddeus is the message of Jesus Christ, that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, that through trusting him, we can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And that's what this, the message of Jude Thaddeus is about, and that's the story I'm trying to tell. And like I'm saying, like I said before, I believe that it's important for us to get back in the Bible and go back to first century Christianity, and also go back to the apostles. Jesus sent these men out. He is intimately known by them. He chose them. They didn't chose, choose him. He chose them for a specific person, a purpose. And he sent them. He sent Thaddeus, Jude Thaddeus, to the Assyrians. He sent Thomas to the Indians. Uh, he sent Peter to Antioch and later on to Rome. Uh, James stayed in Jerusalem as a, as a witness through his holy life and martyrdom to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostles were chosen to, to spread the message, the good news of the kingdom of God, and we've inherited that from them, and we need to share this message because there's a lot of problems in the world, and Jesus taught a message of love, forgiveness, compassion, and charity, and this world needs this message now more than ever. So it's time for us to share the story of the love of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, to show the story of the love of Jesus Christ, and we can do that through the story of the Gospels, but also the stories of the men who were directly chosen by Jesus Christ and sent out. And uh, we need to listen to what God has to say about listening to his son and the message that Jesus sent his 12 apostles to spread. So I'm praying for you. I pray that you be blessed, and I pray that you join us in our next episode. And please like, uh, subscribe, and share. God bless you.